Why we love the Song Dynasty. Exploring the history and charm of one of China's most fascinating dynasties. Episode 10 The Rise and Fall of the Imperial Obsession with Tea. In this podcast, we're going to look at how the flamboyant tastes of the Song Dynasty emperors played a vital role in popularizing tea drinking in China, even changing the landscape of the country, and at how even this obsessive fascination would eventually fade away. I'm Bob Jones, and in this Why We Love the Sung Dynasty podcast, I'm throwing the spotlight on what was to become one of China's most iconic dynasties in the country's long and colourful history. Emperor Hui Tsung of the Sung Dynasty was a very gifted man. Sadly, though, he was an expert in just about everything except statesmanship, which you might think is a crucial skill for a ruler. He was a keen calligrapher and a painter as well. He collected fine art and even enjoyed landscape gardening, designing parks. Naturally enough, his courtiers went out of their way to make him happy, which essentially meant feeding all those insatiable artistic appetites. However, he especially loved tea. But Emperor Hui Tsung of Sung didn't like any old tea. It had to be the best tea tips plucked around the awakening of the insects solar term. The tea had to be made with the best water, using the best utensils, and sipped from the very best crockery. Basically, everything had to be the best. We know all this because he wrote a book, A Treatise on Tea, in which he set out absolutely everything that he knew about making the beverage, and that was a lot. Growing. Making. Drinking. Where tea was concerned, Emperor Hui Tsung liked to get his hands dirty. Instead of sitting on his throne and watching his flunkies making it, he would do it himself. He reveled in the seven steps of the tea ceremony, how to add the water, controlling the force of the whisking with his wrist, and the correct way to rotate the brush, keeping the foam afloat and dispersing it at the end. He could talk for hours on the best way to make tea. But it wasn't just tea-making the emperor liked to do himself. It was anything artistic. He often favoured these activities over state affairs, one of the main reasons, perhaps, that led to the eventual fall of his empire. Remember, though, in Sung society, the emperor was the trendsetter. Whatever he did, his court did, along with the nobles, all the way down to the ordinary people. But without this obsession with the finer things in life, we would not have the wealth of artistic endeavour dating from the Sung dynasty. Let's take a deep dive into his treatise on tea. Apart from a guide to the best tea to drink, it also covers the rules concerning tea production and its preparation. It discusses the best porcelain, at the time, it was black glazed teacups from the Jen kiln. They were usually small, with special effects on the side, such as hare's fur, oil spot, and partridge feather, caused as the iron in the glaze is forced out during firing. These have now become national treasures and high prized by collectors. The Sung Dynasty scholar Tsai Xiang mentioned this preference in his book The Record of Tea. Tea is of light colour and looks best in black cups. The cups made at Jian An are bluish black in colour, marked like the fur of a hare. Being of rather thick material, they retain the heat, so that when once warmed through, they cool very slowly and they are additionally valued on this account. None of the cups produced at other places can rival these. Blue and white cups are not used by those who give tea-tasting parties. 
Emperor Huizong especially liked the hare's fur stripy cup best, but even today they are not easy to make. Combined with the tastes of the emperor, this rarity has made them even more valuable. Needless to say, if the emperor gave you a black glazed teacup, then you were seriously in his good books. The tastes of emperors not only shaped those of the court, but also the landscape of China. An all-time favourite tea was white tea, so much so that the people were ordered to plant the trees and soon nearly every household had such a tree in their tea garden. The best teas were sent as gifts to high officials and scholars, but this practice sometimes brought the worst out in people. Indeed, there were cases of sabotage by farmers who were jealous of their neighbours' tea trees. Zai Xiang once wrote a poem about a crop that had been destroyed through jealousy, which had developed a new twig against all the odds, the leaves of which made tea even finer than before. We learned in the last show that bamboo was often used to make the brushes for whipping up the foam during tea ceremonies. Many of the Sung emperors, though, chose gold and silver for their utensils. In his treatise on tea, Emperor Huizong wrote, Break the jade, tingle the gold, sip the essence. Break the jade meaning break up the tea cake. Tingle the gold refers to shattering the tea cake in a gold utensil creating a powder. Then, finally, sip the essence. It was their practice to suck the tea foam, bit by bit, rather than knocking it back British style. What goes up must come down. It's a law of science. While the Song emperors were obsessed with tea and tea ceremonies, the practice remained popular across the realm, among every social class. It fitted nicely into the rest of the Song dynasty habits, meditation, collecting and appreciating fine things. But the meditations on tea were never religious and were more connected with a sense of self-satisfaction. In fact, so long as the setting was right, the tea was prized for whatever reason, the process was appreciated and you could show off all these things to your courtiers, nobles and people, then everything in the tea garden was lovely. Most ordinary people couldn't tell whether the tea was fabulous or not. Head back out onto the streets of the Song Dynasty and you're just as likely to find people adding spring onions, ginger, orange peel and even dough cake to their tea. So long as it quenches the thirst, what does it matter? Tea also played a role in who was appointed to official positions, especially the transport commissioner for Fujian, whose principal job was locating the finest teas and shipping them to the emperor's courts as tributes, often at the expense of the ordinary people. Our hero poet of the Sung dynasty, Su Dong Po, who we got to know in our last edition, wrote a poem, a satire, cunningly titled Lament on the Lychee, which in parts was anything but a reflection on the little fruit. It was quite wide-ranging and sometimes damning about the imperial court's like of luxury at the expense of the people. Every ten li a station swirling with dust, every five li a post to urge the couriers on. Men die like flies, their corpses line the road, so that lychees and lungans may be delivered to court. Carriages race over hills, boats sweep through the seas, with new plucked fruit on fresh boughs, the leaves still dewy, all to win a smile from the beauty in the palace, 
though it cost bloodshed and strife, and its effect remains forever. The poem laments the fashion for putting so many human resources into a habit which, at the end of the day, was simply the trappings of affluence. The craze for tea in ancient China reached its peak during the Song dynasty and relied heavily on the liking of the emperors for luxury. The best teas, tea sets and tea houses were way beyond the pockets of the ordinary people. After the emperors lost interest, tea appreciation declined markedly. Later dynasties weren't such tea junkies. The Ming dynasty's founding emperor, Zhu Yuanzhang, for example, was not high-born. He was well aware of the way ordinary farmers had to suffer to grow and make the compressed tea cakes, and so banned any official from presenting them to court. These days, despite a big revival in tea drinking in China, the Chinese seldom drink powdered tea as the Song dynasty would have known it. The habit is falling into oblivion. One thing will never change. China will always be associated with tea, thanks in large part to the Song dynasty. Although these days, it's not just about making tea look good. It has to smell and taste great. Special thanks go out to San Lian Zhongdu for their help in creating the content for this show. This is Bob Jones. Thanks for listening. Join me again next time. This has been a China Plus podcast. If you like the show, please give us a rating and be sure to subscribe wherever you listen. If you've got any questions or feedback, please feel free to contact us via email at podcast at cri.com.cn or find us on Twitter, China Plus Pods.